Well, if you knew anything about the battle that goes on in my mind whenever I work on a message, you would know that titling of messages is one of my, uh, it's one of the hardest things I do. <laughs> That's really a pretty pathetic thing when you stop and think about it. Most sermons, I, I wait until after I've preached them to actually title them. Uh, and, and then sometimes I, I come up with multiple titles for a sermon before I even get the sermon put together. And this was one that I have about a half a dozen titles for. So I'm just going to give you all of them. And then maybe by the grace of God, somewhere along the way, this unimportant task that I do will get a single title given to it. I've titled this message, Fear Not, The Blasphemer Will Die. I like that title. I, I titled this, God's Effortless Victory. Now, I'm probably going to save that title for the full chapter. I've titled this message, A Message of Judgment and Comfort. Yeah, that one doesn't have a lot of glamour to it. But it's a good message. It's a good title. I've titled this, we, we sang a song actually by this title. I titled this message, Behold Your God. I've titled this message, this is, I'm probably, I'm probably, I'm not even going to read it to you. Okay, I've, I'm going to go ahead. It's really not that bad. It's Hezekiah's response to Sennacherib's message. Yeah. Well, titles, titles are pretty important. And I think that whenever I was at the end of the reason why I even bring this up, I think that all of these types of titles speak to the message in which Isaiah the evangelist wants the reader to eventually hear and to know. And that is ultimately here, you have nothing to fear. You have nothing at all whatsoever to live in fear in this day. Our God wins the effortless victory. And He is a mighty and powerful and almighty God. Here we have in, in, in Isaiah chapter 36, 37, 38, and 39 is actually a retelling of a story or, or a historic narrative that's recorded for us in 2 Kings and it's also recorded for us in 2 Chronicles. So it tells us something that here is a historic narrative account that is retold multiple times. Uh, I think that's important to note that when anything is spoken of in Scripture, we should stop and pay attention to it. When something is repeated multiple times I think it should even help us to understand the significance the importance of what may lie here in this and so we should take this what we can call a, a literary break in the full prophetic language of Isaiah and consider the historic narrative genre that he uses the form of literature that he's using at this point not missing the the, the, the message that God has for us here because of the change of the type of form that he uses. But I think even as much, even with as, as much attention to the fact that here we are sitting down upon an event that has been retold to us now three separate times. So when we come to this particular juncture of chapter 37... You have the, the bigger picture of what's going on here. You have, you have, you have the, the mighty Sennacherib, the king of the greatest nation the world has ever known up until this time. He's basically taken on all of the world with, with two exceptions. Uh, one being Egypt, which he really has no concern of himself about. Remember here at the gate of Jerusalem that, that Rabshakeh, uh, criticizes Hezekiah for even thinking that Egypt would be any kind of a sufficient ally for him. He even accuses Egypt of being a reed, a, 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 a reed. Now, in the desert regions like you and I live in, uh, we, we, don't, we may not know much about the nature of a reed, but it is a sharp, it can cut, it can pierce. It would be like equivalent to us in the desert regions to a to, to the mighty, magnificent New Mexico State flower, the yucca. Now, who names a flower a yucca? <laughs> Unless you live in a desert, I guess. But the, the, 
the, the nature of the yucca behaves very similar to that of a reed in its sharpness and its pierceness. Now, if you've never actually touched a yucca plant, it, you have to be extremely careful with it. It is a razor sharp. It will cut you. It will pierce you. It will cause excruciating pain to your life. So Rabshakeh, sending the message of his great king, laughs essentially at Jerusalem and specifically Hezekiah for leaning upon the reed of Egypt because it's just going to pierce you. It's just going to cut you. It's going to leave you in greater damage. You've gone to a hope that someone's going to help you and that one that you're hoping for is actually going to pierce you. He's actually going to hurt you. It's going to cause damage to you. So Sennacherib's use of this is to, is, he's, he's taunting, he's ridiculing, he's belittling God's people and ultimately in his discourse, as it's reiterated here in the 37th chapter, uh, in, in, from about verses 6 through, the, through, uh, through 13, when he speaks about all of these other kingdoms, that none of their gods have been able to save them from the great and mighty Assyrian king. So why are you thinking your God is any different? So let's pick apart a little bit of, of the nature and the condition of where Hezekiah lands here. We can see that Hezekiah's response in chapter 37, he is disgraced, he's humbled, he's distressed, I should say, rather than disgraced. He's distressed, he's humbled, and he's seeking for an answer. We can see this in verse number 3 that Hezekiah says this, this day, right now, the news that you've brought back from the gate of the city, this is a day of distress. It is a day of rebuke. It is a day of rejection. For the children have come to birth and there is no strength to deliver. Now that's actually employing a graphic poetic language that anyone reading could have some kind of an understanding. Especially those of you who have endured long, long hours of labor. The exhaustion that it comes and that it brings to, I know nothing of, but certainly Isaiah wants to bring the vivid description here. Exhaustion, strength is all gone. There's nothing left in the city. There's nothing left among us to, to come forth and give hope to the younger generation. It's all gone. The great king of Assyria has, has declared it at the gate. How can we go now home to our, to our children, to our families and say, Hey, give your children great hope that the city will endure. He's essentially saying the great king has come and he's said it. And apparently it's going to happen this way. There's nothing left in us. We have nowhere else to go. So, in verse 4, where he says, Perhaps the Lord your God... Now, this is a message. Keep in mind, these are messages that are being sent back and forth from first from Sennacherib through Rabshakeh to the three messengers at the gate that go to Hezekiah. Hezekiah's response, he's noted by the ripping of his clothes and the wearing of sackcloth that he's in great distress, that he's been humbled and that he's seeking Almighty God for an answer. He sends message through his messengers. Go and find Isaiah. Go and tell this to Isaiah and make sure Isaiah knows this. If anyone in the land knows how to answer this or what the answer to this is, it's got to be the preacher. It's got to be the messenger of hope. Go find Isaiah and tell him the situation. Tell him all hope is lost. Tell him the next generation, they have nothing to hope for. Tell him, what shall we do? In doing so, verse number 4, perhaps the message to Isaiah... Perhaps the Lord your God will hear the words of Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, offer a prayer for the remnant that is left. Now, the, the request from Hezekiah is actually, he, keep in mind that I do think that is a valiant response. He's, he's turned to the right place. 
He's turned to the messenger of God and he says, we need a word from God today. We, we, we've not come to you today to tell us simple things. We've not come to you to tell us easy things. We've come to you, Isaiah, because there is no place else for us to turn. We've come to you today because there is no other God for us to turn to. And so they come and they appeal to him to pray that the Lord God Almighty would respond to the blasphemous response or the blasphemous charges from Sennacherib through his messenger. Come now and speak. Say a prayer for the remnant. Now we've been hearing about the remnant from the first of the book of Isaiah. Several times we've come across this this, this uh, language of the remnant, a language where there is, there is the larger nation, the southern kingdom specifically of Judah, and they're in the capital city of Jerusalem most specifically. But in all the times of Isaiah's preaching, he's made emphasis upon a group of, inside of this larger nation, a group inside of this specific city known as the remnant. So it tells us something. The word itself tells us this is a few in number. A, a, a few holdouts who believe Yahweh himself will save us. The remnant have, co have, have come together and, and they're speaking now through their king and saying, tell Isaiah we need him to pray to the, to the Lord God Almighty and to pray for the remnant. Pray that the remnant, even though all hope is lost, Pray that the remnant will not lose sight of their great hope. Pray that the remnant will find their joy in God. Verse 5, we see then though, so the messengers of King Hezekiah came and the implication is here that they give this message to Isaiah. And so Isaiah's response to this message we can look at this in this respect, and this will be essentially the, the place where we'll make application of the text that we're looking at, but let's, let's get the context in place. So Isaiah has said, thus you shall say to your master, so thus you shall tell the king, thus says the Lord, do not be afraid. Well, that's a good word, isn't it? That is, a, that, that is a soothing word. That is a helpful word. The second thing he tells us is that, and he'll show us in this, in the larger story, we see that God is in control. You see it in verse number 7. Behold, remember this is a word from God. So God will put a spirit. That word spirit is literally a breath. He will breathe in him so that, meaning Sennacherib, so that he will hear a rumor and return to his own land. So I think it's important that we would note that God is in control of Sennacherib. God brought him to the gate to taunt. God brought him to the gate to, to, to intimidate. God brought him to the gate to blaspheme even his own name. And God turns back through his messenger Isaiah and says to the king Hezekiah, remember his condition, he's torn his clothes and he's wearing sackcloth, he's in great distress. And he's telling, Isaiah is telling the king through his messengers that God will cause confusion to come upon Sennacherib and he will be in his own land. The last time they saw the last news they know of Sennacherib is that his messenger is at the gate. He must not be far away. So not only should they not be afraid of this mighty king of Assyria, but also that God is in control and that God will cause him to hear a rumor and he will return to his own land. And then a third thing that we would see here in this text, that God will indeed destroy the blasphemer. The last thing he says in that seventh verse, remembering again who the I is, who the pronoun I is referred to. It's not Isaiah. It's not Hezekiah. It's God. I will make him fall by the sword of his own, in his own land. So first, do not be afraid. 
Second, God is in control. Third, God will destroy the blasphemer. Now, I don't know what circumstances you're walking through today, but can I say those are three things I need to hear today. Do not fear, Paul. I am in control, Paul. And Paul, I will destroy the blasphemer. Your circumstance, your situation looks bleak. It looks hard. It looks too big to overcome. Would it not be a good thing to hear from the evangelist Isaiah today that in, in, in this circumstance, that it appears all hope is lost. The city is about to be taken. And the word from God is do not fear. Now let's look closely at this. What, what is Isaiah telling Hezekiah specifically not to fear? Look at it in the verse, in verse 6. It's very specific about what he tells him not to fear. Do not be afraid because of what? Because of the words that you heard. You remember those words? Rabshakeh showed up at the gate. You remember those three messengers from Hezekiah are out there and they're actually hoping, they're actually even instructing and telling, pleading that Rabshakeh would use his Aramaic language and not their native language. Because look all around you, Rabshakeh, the people are listening to what you have to say. And we don't want them hearing what you have to say. But they're hearing it because Rabshakeh is arrogant enough and because he's under God's control, he speaks in the language that all of the people would hear. So this is a good word that Isaiah the evangelist would respond back to Hezekiah. Do not be afraid of the words which you heard. Think about how helpful that is. How, how often do you hear in your own head or, or by the messages of our culture and, and it's by the words or by the images that the culture is constantly bombarding you with what are those things that haunt your mind what are those things that cripple you from being happy in the Lord what are these things that are actually keeping you imprisoned could you could you put yourself today as an encircled city by the enemy who's taunting your God, blaspheming your God, and your God's response to you back is, do not be afraid of the words that you hear. I can tell you, church, that's a good word to hear. Stop and think of all the circumstances that you've faced in your life. The words that the enemy wants to keep you from resting in God. He comes and he taunts your village. He taunts your mind. He taunts your very, your, fa your very family. He taunts your church. He taunts your city. Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard. You th if, you, if, you think, if you think a bit further of this, do not be afraid of these words that cause you to not trust the Lord. Now you know that that, that whenever states are in their legislative sessions, that a lot of things go through the legislative uh, processes. Some, mo I would say most of them are good. They're helpful. I, I want to believe that they are anyway. But you know, every year there are attempts. Some arrogant blasphemer of God shows up at the state's capital with some word to taunt, to scare, to ridicule, to belittle. At least for the last six years that I'm aware of, and probably be before that, there is a group of people, and it's a growing group of people, by the way. They show up at the state house, and they want the state education board to teach the children of Idaho their sexual values, and they are in, 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 in absolute contrast to the word of God. Now, by the grace of God, thus far, we've been able to hold these things off. But everything that I'm watching when these things come before our legislators is that they come with greater audacity every year. 
And they find a, they find a people willing to come and do their bidding for them. And they do so, and they're attempting to do so with increasing taunting, with, with an increasingly taunting language. You well know this as well, that at, at our legislative session this year, we've had a bill that has sat on a desk of the, the chairman of the, uh, of the State Affairs Committee. And my own personal conversation with him, with other pastors in the region, is literally he's crippled with fear. He's crippled with fear because, because an enemy has showed up and said, if you dare remove abortions from the state, I'm sure of this, that flags, flagpoles everywhere across the United States will begin to fly the pink flag of Planned Parenthood, and you, state of Idaho, will become, the, the, first of all, you'll become the, the laughing stock of the nation. And then you become the fundraising position for the great hater of God's created life, human life. Great fear keeps individuals from trusting God. First of all, you have to consider what God are the individuals, does an individual trust in. Certainly, if your God is not the Almighty God, then I can understand why fear strikes you. I can understand why you would be paralyzed to even give consideration to laws that would either, either protect families, that would either protect parents. And by the way, side note here, every parent in this room ought to pay close, close, close attention when the State Board of Education wants to talk about sex education. They're not just looking for public educated students. They're looking for every child in the state. That means private charter and homeschool they want to indoctrinate your children with a more liberated idea of sexuality they want this and I'm convinced they will not stop until God either stops them or they get their way do not grow weary in this day You consider it from a personal vantage point. You consider it from a state or a national vantage point. What about from families and churches? Again, many people come and with their messages against families. And church, by the way, you stand... I don't think you stand necessarily as an anomaly of the church, but you certainly stand as an anomaly of the cultural church where you're in a room filled with boys and girls of all ages. This is a rare thing. It's, by the way, just frankly, you, 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 don't, you don't need your preacher to tell you, it's hard work to do this. It's hard work because sometimes it's noisier than others. It's hard work because sometimes it's more active around you than other times. Sometimes, and I'm just talking about those of you who don't have children. Can you imagine what it's like with those of you who do? The push from the culture to you is let somebody else take care of these children. Leave the training of spiritual things to the professionals. I, I've been saying this for years. You are the professionals. People ask me whenever I'm in other convention meetings or meetings with other pastors and they always want to talk about what they're doing with their children and their youth and listen I don't fault them for that. I think, it's, I think they ought to give attention to these things but then they want to know about our children's director and our youth pastor or youth minister and I tell them I don't know what it's like in your church but I have I have dozens of children's directors I have dozens of youth leaders youth pastors and youth ministers I don't I don't know how to better do this than to follow the Word of God and say parents don't relinquish this God of authorized duty of yours even to somebody as trustworthy as the church. Don't do it. Now, when I say that, let me follow that up with saying this. You better be doing what you should be doing. You do need to be teaching these boys and girls the godly things of the Word of God. Teach them to read. Teach them to count. Teach them good manners. Teach them how to talk with, to adults. 
Teach them how to engage with, with others their same age. But do not ever not teach them the most important thing, and that is teach them about God. So do not be afraid because of the words which you hear. Don't be afraid of them. This is Isaiah to Hezekiah. The culture has come with their banners. You're doomed. You might as well give up. You're the remnant. <laughs> Who are you kidding? This isn't the way everybody else does this. Well, second side note here is also don't take pride in yourself because you are different. Keep yourself humble. Keep yourself full of joy in the Lord while you follow him and you obey him. So do not be afraid, Isaiah tells the messengers to tell Hezekiah. Don't be afraid of these words. Don't be afraid of their warnings. Don't be afraid of their taunting. Don't be afraid of their blasphemy. Make note of this. God is in control. He is in control of everything. And may I add, he is effortlessly in control of everything. For God to be in control is no problem, is no difficulty, is no perplexing condition for him. Because he is God, there is none greater than him. He has not created anything. So put away your foolish philosophical ideas of, is there a, is there a rock that God could create that's too big for God to lift? Don't, 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 don't go chasing down foolish philosophical ideas. Ideas that the world wants to trip up the idea of a mighty God. There is nothing that an almighty God that, that is impossible for him to do. It is not impossible for him to be even in control of the difficult situation that you currently find yourself in this very moment. You might be finding yourself in a work situation that is com complex on every level. I would say to you here, rejoice that God is in control even of the complex, difficult work situation that you're in. You think about your financial situation. Now, now keep in mind here, my, my duty this morning is not to fix every problem that there is in life. My duty today is to bring a word from God that Isaiah brought through, that God brought through Isaiah to Hezekiah and then make application of it onto your own lives. So when I talk about finances, I, I, I'm not going to stand before you and give you a seven-point or a seven-step pathway to be debt-free. But if you stop and consider what has brought you into your debt, is it because of foolish decisions, careless decisions? If so, then give attention to it and get, get control of it and, 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 and don't let it own you. Don't let it keep you in bondage. But could it also be that you're in a difficult financial situation because God's going to use the complexity of your day right now to display His glory at some point, even while you're in the financially difficult season? The problem about finances is that we're always thinking, someday, I'll not be strapped financially. That might be true for some people, but I don't see any promise in Scripture that hardships financially are ever wiped away for followers of God. If you could think for a moment and think about the conditions in the city of Jerusalem. Now they're difficult for the whole of the city. But how much more difficult are they for the remnant? These are individuals who are finding it harder and harder to live with values and distinct ethics inside of a city that continues to grow increasingly liberal. So do, do, do not think that even though the circumstances of the culture that we're in, that God is somehow not in control. He's in control of everything. You notice that in verse 7. God said, I will put a spirit in him. That's very active. It's very intentional. It's not passive. I'll let a spirit overcome him. It's not I'll send someone else to put a spirit in him. This is directly 
active work. This is direct active work of Almighty God upon Sennacherib himself. God saying, I will do this. I don't know how many times whenever we journeyed through the kings and now as we've come 37 chapters into the book of Isaiah, do we find the, the very intentional use of the language that God is actively engaged in every circumstance. Do not go into the foolish thinking that God sets everything into motion and then he steps away from it and lets happen whatever happens. No, your God, the God of this Bible, he is active. He is in everything that he's doing. There is nothing that God has not got his hand upon. There is nothing that God's not sustaining, that God is not in complete control of. Now I know there will be some pushback upon this in the philosophical sense. But what do we do about sin? Well, I have no problem with this. You have Sennacherib who's come, who's representing a nation full of great wickedness. He's filled with all kinds of sinful intentions. And from the moment that, that Isaiah refers to us or describes this to us previously, as well as do the kings and the chronicles, that God himself will whistle to the king of the north to come. God has no problem in using sinful, wicked people to do his work. He's done it before. Do not be surprised. He'll do it again. But in all circumstances, he is in control. And then comes the, the reason for rejoicing. You should rejoice in this, dear church. Rejoice that the great blasphemer Sennacherib, he will be defeated. He will he'll fall by his own sword in his own land. He'll fall, and by the way, we're in the chapter, one of the most miraculous military de defeats of any nation has ever been recorded is right here in chapter 37. No other military disaster happens like this for an enemy of God's people than what's here in chapter 37. We're not going to get to it today, but you can certainly read ahead and perhaps you're already fully aware of the 185 soldiers of the Assyrian kingdom that will fall in one breath of God. <laughs> Rejoice in this, dear church. The blasphemer, the great blasphemer, he will be defeated. Rejoice in this. As you're struggling through the, the, the taunting of the things that bombard your mind, of the things that are attacking your family, of the things that set your church apart from, the, from others, of that which would even describe the remnant of God's people in a land that is increasingly hating of God's things, Rejoice in this today. God will destroy the great blasphemer. This is everything. We're in the season of the calendar year that points toward that glorious moment of the cross where Jesus himself will effortlessly win the victory over sin. Now in the flesh, it'll be a struggle. You'll hear him even struggling in it in the garden. Oh, Father, if there's any other way, can we do it another way? That's his flesh crying out for the stress, the pressure that's all on him. But do not forget at all the picture that's happening here. The great king, the, 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 the great creator of the universe effortlessly puts sin to death by the death of his son, by the burial of his son, and by the resurrection of his very son as well. So rejoice in this, that the great blasphemer, he will be destroyed by God's effortless victory at the cross. Has fear come upon you today? Listener, I would say to you, trust God. The fear that's there is because there's been a lot of words hurled at you. Can I, can I speak real frankly and lovingly to you? You need to hear a word from God. You need to open up your Bible and you need to give preference to the Word of God. You, you, you saw what Isaiah said in verse number 6. Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard. The problem in many cases, the things that strike us with the greatest fear, is because we give ourselves to the hearing of those who are constantly 
taking us to the point where we cannot see ourselves living outside of this fear. Can I invite you into the sweetest place of all, the Word of God. Now here will be a great danger for some. When we go to the Word of God, sometimes we can't help ourselves. We'll read a good word, and yet we'll hear, we'll only hear the bombardment of all the negative things that we've been filling ourselves up with all along. We're too crippled by fear that when we read a beautiful, a glorious thing in God's Word, the only thing we can do is interpret it in a negative way. Oh, don't give yourself into that fear. Hear the Word of God. Know this. In that circumstance, as bleak as it may be, as complex as it may be, God is in control. Stop listening to the outside voices. Start listening to the message that God has brought to Hezekiah through Isaiah the prophet. Let's look closely at it in our own application of our own lives. Trust God today and stop listening to all of the negative words in the culture. Then, in final application upon this, there is essentially two, or to, to further to flesh this out in its, in its fullness, we could make the application again in the allegorical sense as John Bunyan does in a glorious way in that allegory, the holy war. You could listen to Sennacherib and think that Sennacherib must be accurate and true. You can listen to those words and obey those words and cower in a corner and, and wait for Sennacherib to come and, and to rule you. Do you, remember, do you remember how Sennacherib used the words there at the gate, he intended, these were, these were intentional words. They were, come on, let me in the gate, surrender yourselves today, and I've got land for you. I've got a peaceful place for you. I've got a place that will satisfy all of your needs, all of your pleasures, all of your comforts. Come on. Pay no attention that it says trap on the outside of this box. As soon as you give yourself into those words, he pulls the string out and you're enslaved and he's now your master. But rather today, rather than listen to what Sennacherib has to say through his messenger, why not today listen to what the Lord God Almighty says through his messenger, Isaiah? Through the preacher, the evangelist, who's come with a good word, who's come with good news. Trust the Lord. Stop listening to others. Do not forget that God is in control and God will destroy the great blasphemer. Find your confidence in him, rest in him, and find joy in him today.